Take your Bible and turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5. And we'll begin reading at the first verse. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the first public sermon that Jesus gives. And they set the theme for all of his teaching and preaching ministry. We're not going to try to go through all of that this morning, but I do want to... Uh, go through a portion of it with you. So Matthew chapter 5 and beginning at verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall uh, say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you ye are the salt of the earth but if the salt hath lost its savor wherewith shall it be salted it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men ye are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I want to call your attention to those last two verses, verses 15 and 16, where Jesus says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. We ask for your sweet and blessed Holy Spirit to come now at this time and to speak to our hearts, to touch each one of us according to the need of our heart and mind and life. Lord, forgive us anything that would stand in the way of your moving and blessing and cause us, Lord, to be open to exactly what the Spirit will say to this church in this hour. Help us, Lord, to see what you would have us to do. Again, Lord, we pray if there's a soul listening today who doesn't know you as Savior, that they would open their heart and they would trust you and be saved. And Lord, for those who do know you, strengthen us, help us, cause us, to, again, to see exactly how we can be witnesses, testimonies, and lights for you. Now, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm using a title today, uh, Punching Holes in the Darkness. It's not original with me. Uh, I got it from another sermon, to tell you the truth. And in that sermon that I read, the author of that sermon gave a quote by Robert Louis Stevenson. Robert Louis Stevenson, you may know, he wrote... Uh, Treasure Island and Kidnapped and, and other works. Uh, that book, Treasure Island, when I was a young boy, improved my vocabulary. It, it did, because I liked the story. And as I was reading the story, there were words in there that I did not know I was not familiar with. So I would have to look up the words and find out what the words meant so I could go on with the story. And it helped me a lot. It, it, it really helped me to improve my vocabulary. Uh, and I, I just liked the story anyway. So this quote is not from the book Treasure Island, but it is by the same writer, Robert Louis Stevenson. He said this, and listen carefully. A little boy was looking out a window and watching the men come down the street, lighting the lights in the old lampstands. Every night he watched them climb a ladder, light the lamp, and then move to the next one. When asked what he was doing, he replied, I'm watching men knock holes in the darkness. Now think about that. 
He said, I'm watching men knock holes in the darkness. The night blankets the whole world with darkness. But a few people, a few people punch holes in the darkness. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while as yet day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, John 9, 4 and 5. We live in a world that is lost. We live in a world that is lost in the darkness of sin. Uh, many years ago, I was working at a camp up in Tennessee, and down uh, the valley uh, from the camp was on top of a mountain, and down in the valley there was a cave, and sometimes we'd take campers down there, uh, usually on a Monday night, I think, and uh, take them exploring in the cave. So people would go in ahead of time and, and, and set up stations, and there would be a uh, guides, and we would have flashlights because there was absolutely no light. At that point, they told us we were a mile underground. That is total darkness. There's no light at all. And we would have the flashlights, and we would guide the campers through there, and we'd enter a room of the cave in which there was a large pool of water. And we'd have everybody sit around the pool of water and, and make sure that everyone was seated. And then I would say to them, turn off your flashlights. And they did. I said, now you understand what total darkness is. No light at all. It's quite the experience. It's quite the experience. Think about our day. Think about the darkness of our day. And think about who is punching or knocking holes in the darkness. I did some research. I want to share some statistics with you. Uh, stay with me. You probably didn't come here to get a lecture on statistics, but just, just listen, if you will, for a moment. There are, in the United States of America, every year, new churches being planted. There are deliberate efforts all over this country to start new churches. I often talk here about Brother Ryan Price. Brother Ryan was with us for about three years here and helped us so much in the ministry. But from the day he came, we knew that it was his desire to be a church planter. And so he went out from here and started a church in Fort Lauderdale. And then from there, uh, they started another church in Isla Mirada Key, and then a church in Miami Beach, and then a church in Key West. Uh, that's church planting. And there are new churches being started here every year. But at the same time, in this country, there are churches closing every year. Let me share with you some statistics. Again, listen carefully. In 2006, there were, and the numbers I'm going to give you are churches of all kinds, gospel preaching churches, Bible preaching churches, and churches that do not preach the gospel nor believe the Bible. In 2006, there were 414,000 churches in the United States of America. In 2012, just six years later, there were 384,000 churches in the United States of America. Even though churches are being started all the time, that's a net loss of 30,000 churches in six years. In 2020, it was reported that there were 350,000 churches in this country. Again, a net loss of 30, uh, 34,000 churches in eight years. Of those, 350,000 churches, 16% of them were classified as mega churches. That means an average weekly attendance of 2,000 or more. 16%. But the average church has a weekly attendance of 75 people. Now that makes us pretty much an average church. But I want to go beyond that. If we are average, and you factor in those mega churches that have attendance of average of 2,000 people or more, and the average is 75, that means that there's a great number of very small churches. And friends, what I'm trying to help you with is to understand that the light is not getting brighter. In 1937, that's the first year that Gallup polls put a, how many of you heard of Gallup polls? Sure you have. Yeah. 
first year that they uh, did a report, in 1937, it was reported that 70% of the people, the population of the United States, 70% of them were church members, 1937. Again, that's any kind of church. In 2020, the number was given as 47%. That is, again, a net loss of 27%. 27% fewer people proportionate to the population of the United States are members of churches. At the same time, I read that since the year 2000, take note of that, the year 2000. And while you're thinking about the year 2000, think about did something significant happen in the year 2001? Keep that in mind. I read that since the year 2000, the number of mosques in the United States has increased by 74%. Churches are declining, mosques are increasing at a greater rate than churches are. The number of church members in the U.S., as we said, 47%. That means 53% of the population of the United States are not members of any church. Of that 47% who say they are members of a church, the question becomes, do they attend a gospel preaching Bible-believing church. Beyond that, how many of those 47% of the population are truly saved? How many of them know the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't have any statistics on that. Not sure how we would get them. But I can tell you that those who know the Lord Jesus, who have trusted him for forgiveness of their sins, are in the minority. Well, how? what do you... What do you attribute that to? Who would you blame for that? Well, we could say the society. The society has become corrupt. But I, I wouldn't blame the society. You can say the government. Well, the government makes it difficult. I wouldn't blame the government. Who do you blame? I blame the churches. We can't point our finger at other people. We have to look at ourselves. The majority of people in our country are lost in the darkness of sin, and they are, as Paul wrote, without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's Ephesians 2.12. Those of us who know the Lord, those of us who have trusted him, those of us who know the gospel of Jesus Christ need to be working to punch holes in the darkness. Now, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to do that? I want you to look again, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. Jesus said, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. We can't hide the light. We can't be secretive about it we can't be quiet about it we're not on a secret agent mission where we have to hide our Id identity we need to be open about the gospel we need to be open about sharing the truth that God has given to us now Jesus said to his followers you are the light of the world let your light so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Notice that last phrase of verse 16. Glorify who? Your Father which is in heaven. We're not to do good works so people pat us on the back or give us awards or recognition and say, boy, what good people you are. That's not it. That might be a byproduct of it, but what if it isn't? We should do good things anyway. It should never be our motive. Our motive should be to glorify our Father, which is in heaven. You're the light of the world. We're supposed to punch holes in the darkness so that we can show the way to the truth, to the life, to Jesus Christ. You and I should live a life that brings, it, brings light to the eyes, mind, and hearts of the people so that they can see that there's hope. They should be able to see in you and I a difference that causes them to want to be saved. I was listening to a podcast 
uh, just yesterday, I think it was, uh, and it was a testimony of Lee Strobel. You may know that name. He's written many books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Heaven, The Case for the Creator, and many others. Giving his testimony, he said that he had lived a wicked life. He said that he was an atheist. He said that when he would come home from work, his little daughter would take her toys and go into the bedroom and close the door because she didn't want to be in the same room with him. But then he said that his wife came to trust Jesus as her savior. and She began to pray for him. He decided to prove that she was wrong and to show her that Christianity was false, that she had put her faith in something that wasn't real, and he was going to disprove Christianity, and he thought the best way to do that was to simply prove that Jesus never rose from the dead. Some of you know that story. He began to do research, and he came to believe that not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but that he is indeed the Savior. But then he said this, and this is what I want you to hear. He said that he came to realize that he believed the facts and the truth about Jesus, but he did not, had not received Jesus as his Savior. I can relate to that. I can. There was never a time in my life, unlike Lee Strobel, there was never a time in my life when I was an atheist. I always believed there was a God. I could not understand anybody who wouldn't believe there was God simply on the basis of logic. So if you had asked me, do you believe there's a God? I would have said yes. If you had asked me, do you believe that he had a son? I would have said yes. Do you believe his name was Jesus? Yes. Do you believe that he was crucified and rose again? Yes. But I wasn't saved. Well, how could you believe all that and not be saved? Because to me, that was historical fact. If you, just like if you'd asked me, do you believe George Washington was the first president of the United States, the founder of the United States Army, and many other things? Sure, I believe that. Why? Historical fact. But that is not placing your faith. I have not, and, and good thing I haven't, I haven't placed my faith and trust in George Washington. Don't get me wrong, I'm not disrespecting George Washington, but he can't save me. What I am doing is telling you this. You can know about Jesus. You can believe that the facts are true without actually knowing Jesus. And you have to come to that point, and Lee Strobel quoted this. He quoted John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe it on his name. And he said, I realize that I believe, but I hadn't received. So after doing all that research, he came to say, yeah, it's true. But he hadn't applied it to his own heart and life. He said, then I received Jesus. And he asked the Lord to save him. And he said that the Lord Jesus so changed his life that one day he heard his little daughter say that she wanted Jesus to change her the way he had changed her daddy. That was the whole point of the story that I wanted to get across to you. That is letting your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When people want to have what you have, when people see in you that difference and that change. Our churches today, and, and I don't, I'm not picking on other churches, don't, don't think that. But our churches today, in many cases, and this isn't always true, but a large proportion of the time, our churches are trying to be as much like the world as they can be. And that's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. It's not something that just happened. It's purposeful. The purpose is to make people who don't know the Lord comfortable when they come into church. And by the way, as far as that goes, I agree. I want people to be comfortable when you come into church. That is why we turn on the air conditioning when you come to church. We want you to be comfortable. That's why the pews are padded and they're, they're not hard wood. Now, you, some of you smiling. Listen, when I was a boy, we went to church. There was no air conditioning. What'd they do? They opened the windows and you hoped for a breeze. We didn't have fans. Uh, the pews weren't padded. You sat on a hard wood bench. Yeah. 
and the floors weren't carpeted. And I don't think all the time they had a sound system. Some of them did, not all of them. So we do these things to make it comfortable for you. And we want you to be comfortable when you come to church. But there's a difference between being comfortable and being worldly. And so many times we lose what Jesus said in John chapter 17 where he said, we are in the world but not of the world. We are in the world. We have to be in the world. We are not called to live in a monastery and isolate ourselves from the world. If we did that, say, well, couldn't we give ourselves to prayer and study? Sure, you could. But how are you going to reach the world? That's not what the Lord's called us to do. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We can't just keep the gospel within these walls. We have to take it outside these walls to people who need it. So we need to be in the world, but we should not be of the world. There should be a difference in us and the world that is clearly seen. You and I must live in such a way that others want Jesus to do for us, or do for them what he's done for us. So what does that mean? It means we need to live a Christian life. We need to be faithful to the Lord. We need to be faithful to his church. We need to be faithful to his word. We need to glorify God by the way we live. We need to refuse to compromise with things that we know are not right. We need to live a life that shines lights to those around us. In short, we need to punch holes in the darkness. We need to live a Christian life, but we also need to live, uh, I'm sorry, we need to live the life, but we also need to speak a Christian message. If you and I live a godly life, but never speak up to tell people about the Savior, never tell them who it is that has changed our life, then you know what's likely to happen? People are likely to look at us and think, boy, what a good person they are. You know, I work with them, or they're my neighbor, or I've gone to school with them, or I know them in some realm, and they are, he is a good guy, she is a fine lady. I really respect them because they are people of character. Now, that's good as far as it goes, and it should be that way, but that's start, stopping far short of the goal. Because if people do not know that it is Jesus who has changed our life, who has made us the people that we are, how will they ever come to know him? That's why Jesus said, let your light shine before men. They may see your good works and glorify your father. Not glorify you. Glorify your father, which is in heaven. I've seen a little track years ago. We had it here. And I don't have it currently. But it said on the front of it, it said, if you meet me and forget me, you have lost nothing. But if you meet Jesus and forget him, you have lost everything. Now that's an attention getter, isn't it? But it's, it's so true. It's so true. We need to live a Christian life. We need to speak a Christian method, message. So how are we going to do that? Well, number one, give your testimony often. Now, I've told you this before, but I think I need to say it again. Give your testimony often. When I was saved many years ago, Pastor Shermerhorn talked with me about being baptized. Pastor Shermerhorn led me to the Lord. And he said that I should give a testimony of my salvation before the church. Now understand, the church was not large. We were meeting in a rented facility that belonged to the Margate Lions Club. And we, they had a little building there and that the church rented that and that's where we had church. And for, for quite a while, we met in that Lions Club. There weren't as many people in the church total as there are in this room right now. It was a young church. It had only been, been in existence uh, less than a year, just a few months, really. And so he said I should give testimony to the church. Now, I told you the size of the church because I don't want you to think he was asking me to address thousands of people. He wasn't. So he said, oh, you need to give a testimony. And I said to him, well, well, what do I say? He said, just tell them what happened to you. I said, yeah, but what do I say? He said, just tell them what happened to you. I said, yeah, but what do I say? I didn't know what to say. 
I didn't know how to say it. Well, did you give the testimony? I did. What did you say? I don't remember. <laughs> Whatever it was must have been okay because they okayed me to get baptized. But I thought about it. I've thought about it a lot over the years. And quite honestly, we need to be willing and able to give our testimony. And give your testimony often. Leo Albritton was a, a great friend of mine years ago, and he's, he's been to church here a total of one time. And, and you say, well, why didn't he come to church more often? Because he lives in another state. <laughs> and he's only been to Delray once. But he was a great friend of mine, and, and we were very close. And he told me, he said, give your testimony often. He said, it'll do two things for you. Number one, it will keep the experience fresh in your mind. You will, re will review again how you came to know the Lord. What were the circumstances? What were the events that led to you coming to the Lord? It'll renew the experience in your own mind and heart, and that's good for you spiritually. Number two, he said, it is the easiest way for you to share the gospel. It is. Now, I'm going to talk about some other ways here in a moment, but it's the easiest way for you to share the gospel because it's your story. It's what happened to you. I shared with you just a little bit of, of Lee Strobel's testimony. There are other people who can give similar testimonies. Maybe your testimony isn't as dramatic as that. It doesn't have to be. Maybe you're a person who always grew up in a Christian home. Maybe you always went to church and maybe you were always around the things of God, but you didn't know the Lord. So when you did trust the Lord, your life didn't go through the dramatic change that, that many people have gone through. Maybe you're not like the Apostle Paul. You didn't have that Damascus Road experience. And you didn't turn from being a great persecutor of the church to being a great evangelist for the church. Maybe that's you. Don't think that you're any less of a Christian because of that. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, every one of us. Yes, some people's sins are more open. Some people's sins are more graphic. Other people's sins are more subtle. That doesn't mean they're not guilty of sin. Doesn't mean they're not lost. Doesn't mean they don't need to be saved. And the truth of the matter is, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death for all of us. So give your testimony often. I've been telling the story of the day I was saved, the evening really that I was saved, for more than half a century now. You don't have to be eloquent to tell your story. You don't have to be standing in a pulpit to tell your story. You simply need to tell other people how you were saved and tell them that they can also be saved. Their circumstances may not be the same as yours. They don't have to be. What needs to be the same is quite simple. They need to understand that they, like all of us, have sinned and that sin separates us from God and that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, paid for our sins on the cross, was buried and rose again, and is alive today, ready and willing to forgive their sins and give them eternal life. It's that simple. Dr. Lee Robertson uh, was my pastor for seven years and he had a, a different way of soul winning he would just take the Bible and sit down with a person and read to them a portion of scripture that contained the gospel he might read 1 Corinthians 15 or John 3 or some other portion that explained the gospel and after he read it to him he'd, he'd say to the person did you understand that now if they said yes then he would go ahead if they said, no, not quite, he'd say, well, let's read it again. And he'd read it again until they were able to understand what that passage of Scripture was saying. And then he would say to them, would you like to take Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And if they said yes, he'd reach out his hand and says, would you take my hand as a symbol of your receiving Jesus? And when they did, he'd say, now let's pray. And he would lead them in a prayer to trust the Lord. How many people you went to the Lord like that? Tens of thousands. Okay. Now, is that the way to do it? That's one way of doing it. 
And that's why I'm trying to share with you. There are many different methods and plans for presenting the gospel, and many of them work quite well. Uh, I personally like to use and have used for all these decades the Romans Road method. Now that is uh, a series of verses in the book of Romans that show a person what they need to know to be saved. It shows the person that we've all sinned and that they particularly have sinned. It shows that the wages of sin, the penalty of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it concludes in Romans 10 where it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's Romans 10, 9 and 10. In verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. And I would ask the person, do you, do you know the story of how Jesus died on the cross? Most people do. Some people don't. If they don't, take time to tell them the story. Do you know why Jesus died on the cross? A lot of people know Jesus died on the cross, but they don't know why. You should explain to them. And, and it tells us this in Romans. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for our sins. So do you understand that Jesus died for your sins? If they say yes, then we go on from there. If not, then we take time to explain that further. If they say, yes, I understand that. Do you understand that Jesus paid for your sins on the cross? Yes. Would you be willing to trust the Lord Jesus to save you? If they say yes, then we'd say, I say, when do you think would be a good time to do that? You know what most people say? Well, what about right now? And I never disagree with them. <laughs> I say, yeah, I think that's, this is a great time right now. Would you like to call on the Lord and ask him to save you? And then I ask them to pray. Now, there aren't magic words to say in the prayer. You just call on the Lord, say, Lord, you, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that you love me, that you died to pay for my sins. I'm trusting you as my living Savior. It doesn't have to be these precise words. I'm trusting you to forgive me and save me. You know what happens? If they trust the Lord, if they truly with their heart believe on the Lord and trust him to save them, then they have received Christ. They are born again. They are a child of God. Now they are no longer a child of darkness. I'm going to tell you, when I trusted the Lord as my Savior, changed everything, absolutely everything. Now I mentioned the Romans Road method. There's the wordless book method. Brother Clark, who comes here usually on Sunday evenings, Dennis Clark, he, he loved to tell you all about the wordless book. Uh, there's the four spiritual laws method. There's the uh, evangelism explosion method, and there are many others. The primary thing is to show the person that they have their sins forgiven, that they need to be saved from the penalty of sin, show them that that was paid on the cross, and that Jesus rose from the dead. All they need to do is trust him by faith to forgive them and to save them. The people of this world are lost in darkness. They do not know, they don't understand. Listen to what Paul says, Romans 10, 14. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? It's a good question, isn't it? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? You know, we send missionaries to other countries, and we should. We should. Because the world needs to hear, and the Lord told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But listen to me. There are people right here, right in this town, who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, maybe they're from another country. Well, maybe, but maybe they're not. I'm telling you, I have met teenagers. I met one teenage young man who didn't know who God was. I was talking to him about God, and, and I could tell he didn't. I said, you know about God? No. I said, God, you know, God made the trees and the, the sky. And no. He had never heard of God. He knew nothing about God. Where did he live? Right near a church. But he'd never been to church. And nobody from church had ever been to him. 
and nobody had ever told this young man about God. I met another young man, 17 year old, just within easy walking distance of where we are right now. He said I was the only preacher he had ever talked to in his life, 17 years old. Only preacher he'd ever talked to in his life. He didn't know anything about Jesus. He didn't know anything, his family grew up, they were not believers in Jesus. He didn't know anything about Jesus, didn't know anything about the gospel. I was the first person to ever share the gospel with this young man. Another man I met, 35 years old, 35. He told me I've been in church two times in my life, the day I was married and one other time, and that's it. He didn't know anything about the gospel, nothing. I'm telling you, there are people right here in town who never have heard the gospel. Say what's on the radio and on the television, their churches, that's true. That's true. But there's still people who've never heard. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? So what are you going to do? I'll tell you what to do. You pray and you ask the Lord for opportunities to share the gospel with people. Ask him. Amazing thing will happen. You'll get opportunities. You will. They'll come. Now, when you pray that prayer, you need to be prepared. You need to have a plan for what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. I, as a young Christian, young preacher, I found my method had to be just blurted out. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't formulate the words very well, so I'd just get it out there. But here's something else you do. You plan and you prepare what you're going to say, but you also pray and ask the Lord to help you with what to say and how to say it. And while you're talking to the person, while you're talking to them, you pray and ask the Lord to help you. You can pray and talk at the same time you can. How do you know? I do it all the time. Lord knows what's in your heart and your mind. You pray and ask the Lord to help you while you're talking to the person. And then ask the Lord to give you a vision of what he would have you to do. What do you mean? God has certain work for you to do. There's no question about that. A man who I'm pretty sure is not a believer yet, I say yet because I trust he will be. But he asked me, he says, how do I know what God wants me to do? Well, it's a good question. Good question. Ask the Lord to give you a vision of what he would have you to do. Today, what do you want me to do today, Lord? Ask him to show you. He will. Now understand, when you ask that, we do not all have the same material resources. Some of us have more material resources than others. You mean more money than others? Yes, some people have more money than others. That shocked you, didn't it? You didn't know that, did you? Of course you did. Some people have access to other things. This, this will shock you, especially the younger folks here. Not everybody has a computer. Well, that's a shock, isn't it? It gets worse. Not everybody has a phone. You know? Not everybody has the same material resources. We don't all have the same talents. I'm telling you, when I was in college at, at what was Tennessee Temple University, there were a lot of students there, and a lot of them wanted to win souls, and they had talents, so they would use their talents as avenues to reach out to people. One fella I knew was um, absolutely amazing with a yo-yo. He could do tricks with a yo-yo that, that were just, just astounding. I was never very good with one of those things myself. I, I had a couple of them, but I was never really good with them. He was. Now, you've maybe seen people do things where they, they take the string, make kind of a triangle, and have it walk, and maybe you see them spin it out there and roll it back and all that. He could do all of that, but he did a lot more than that. One of the things I remember, he'd have somebody take a wooden match, old wooden match, hold it in their teeth. He put sandpaper on the edge of a yo-yo. He'd spin the yo-yo by and strike the match. I mean, he could do stuff with the yo-yo you wouldn't believe. You know what he'd do? He'd go out to a park, and he'd just start doing his yo-yo tricks. And children gather around to see the, the yo-yo tricks. And he didn't stop doing his tricks. While he's doing his tricks, he'd give them the gospel. 
What was he doing? Using the talent he had as an avenue to reach people for the Lord. We had some champion weightlifters there. I mean champion. What do you mean champion? National, regional, national, international weightlifters. I was not one of them. I'll make that clear to you. My, my father was a great weightlifter. See what a big dumbbell he raised? But anyway, the, the, the point is, the point is these champion weightlifters would do the same thing. They'd go out and put on a weightlifting demonstration, show how they could lift weights and, and get people's attention, then give them the gospel. I could go on and on with this, but I think you got the idea. If you, you can sing, sing. Whatever you can do, whatever God has given you to work with, work with that. We don't all have the same talents. I'm not good with the yo-yo. I'm not a great weightlifter by any means. But I take what I have and do what the Lord allows me to do with it. And that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do. We don't all have the same material resources. We don't all have the same talents. But listen to me. We all have the same God. We do. We all have the same Savior. We all have the same Holy Spirit. And there's only one Savior. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one gospel. I talk about different ways of presenting the gospel, different methods, but it's the same gospel. You take any method you want to and give something that's not the gospel and you'll fail. There's only one gospel. Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Then we need to have a desire and a plan to punch holes in the darkness. How are we going to do it? We can't dispel all the darkness. Jesus can, but we can't. We can't dispel all the darkness, but we can knock a hole in it. We can. We can help people see the way to go. We can show them the right path. We can do that. We can look at this world and the direction it's headed, and we can shake our heads and we can say, it's sad and it's terrible. But the world's so big and the problems are so immense, what can I do about it? President Ronald Reagan said this, he said, we can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. You know what he was saying? He was saying we can't solve everybody's problems, but every one of us can help one other person. And he was right about that. What was he talking about? I think he was talking about society's ills. But what I'm saying is we can help one person. Do you realize that if everybody in this room in their entire lifetime, if you led one other person to Jesus Christ, you'd double the number of Christians that, that are sitting here right now. It's that simple. But it becomes exponential. I'm not a great mathematician, but I know that term. <laughs> it becomes exponential. If you led one person to the Lord, and they led one person to the Lord, and they led one person, it, it grows exponentially. You'll get into millions and perhaps billions have you led a million people to the lord preacher i'm sure i haven't how many people have you led the lord i don't know why don't you know i haven't kept count i know this i know i've given the gospel to literally thousands of people thousands how many of them came to be believers i'm not sure again i didn't try to keep count but what i'm trying to tell you is if we can just reach one may change the world. Man went into a shoe store one day to buy a pair of shoes. That was back when they had shoe stores where they'd come, the person in the store would come sit down with you and, and help you get the shoe and find the right shoe you needed and sit down, make sure it was your size and fit and all that. And the young man who was selling the shoes, this man who uh, went in the shoe store shared the gospel with the young man who was shared, selling the shoes. You know what? Nobody remembers the name of that man who came in and shared the gospel with that young shoe salesman. But you know the shoe salesman, most of you will. His name was Dwight L. Moody. He became one of the greatest evangelists of the 19th century. And his work goes on to this day 
in Chicago, the Moody Church, the Moody Bible Institute, and more. He was used in the United States and in England to bring multitudes of people to Christ because one man walked into a shoe store one day and shared the gospel with one young man who was selling shoes. You see what I mean when if you tell one, if you bring one person to Christ, it can be exponential. Andrew brought Peter to the Lord. You find that in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Peter preached, and one day 5,000 were saved. He preached another time, and 3,000 were saved. And he went on preaching for the rest of his life. He writes two books of the New Testament. He was, I believe, the first pastor. All the apostles were pastors. But I think Peter was first. Why do you think that? Read the end of the Gospel of John. I think you'll see why. We can look at the world, shake our heads, and say, it's sad, it's terrible, but I'm only one person. What can I do? We can pray. We can give our heart to the Lord Jesus. And we can ask him to use us. And if you sincerely pray and ask him to use you, he will. He will. You may not be a D.L. Moody. You might be the man who walks into the shoe store and talks to the one, one young man. But you can punch a hole in the darkness. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you and count it such a wonderful privilege to call you our Heavenly Father. And right now, it is the prayer of my heart that if a person has heard this message today or someone will hear it later electronically who does not know you as Savior that that person would open their heart and trust you as best they know how by faith and call on you and say Lord Jesus I know that like everyone else I have sinned And I understand that you paid for my sins on the cross. And I am right here, right now, trusting you to forgive my sins, to save my soul, as my living Savior, to give me a home in heaven forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, maybe you prayed that prayer with me. Maybe you didn't. But you can still call on the Lord and ask him to save you. I don't remember the exact words you say. That's okay. God knows what's in your heart. You call on him and ask him to save you. Now, believers, would you call on the Lord and ask him to use you? Would you ask him to help you to punch holes in the darkness? Each one can help one. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. As we do, if God has spoken to your heart, there's a spiritual need in your life, that's what we're here for. If you're not 100% sure that your soul is saved, that you're on your way to heaven, I want you to come down front. I'll be on the main floor. You come meet me. We'll have someone sit down with you, take a Bible, and show you from the Bible, the Word of God, how to be saved. Then you make your own decision. We'll not keep you a long time. We'll not try to get you to do anything you don't want to do. We're not asking you to join anything. We're not asking you to sign anything. We're asking you, do you want to know that your sins are forgiven, your soul saved, and you're on your way to heaven? Then, Christian friend, let me ask you, how is the Lord speaking to you right now? What is it that he's saying to you? Do you need to do business with him? Do you need to come and pray? Do you need somebody to pray with you? Is there a decision you need to make? Maybe what I've talked about this morning, maybe nothing I've talked about, but God's been speaking to you and you know it. Let him have his will and his way. If you need to come, come on. Father, bless and move now, we pray. 
In Jesus' name, amen.